The Catcher in the Rye, Chapter 8 It was too late to call out for a cab or anything, so I walked the whole way to the station. It wasn't too far, but it was cold as hell, and the snow made it hard for walking. And my gladstones kept banging hell out of my legs. I sort of enjoyed the air and all, though. The only trouble was, the cold made my nose hurt, and right under my upper lip, where old Stratton laid one on me. He'd smack my lip right on my teeth, and it was pretty sore. My ears were nice and warm, though. That hat I bought had earlaps in it, and I put them on. I didn't give a damn how it looked. Nobody was around anyways. Everyone was in the sack. I was quite lucky when I got to the station, because I only had to wait about ten minutes for a train. While I waited, I got some snow in my hand and washed my face with it. I still had quite a bit of blood on. Usually I like riding on trains, especially at night, with the lights on and the windows so black, and one of those guys coming up the aisle selling coffee and sandwiches and magazines. I usually buy a ham sandwich and about four magazines. If I'm on a train at night, I can usually even read one of those dumb stories in a magazine without puking. You know, one of the stories with a lot of phony, lean-jawed guys named David in it, and a lot of phony girls named Linda or Marcia that are always lighting all the goddamn David's pipes for them. I can even read one of those lousy stories on a train at night, usually. But this time, it was different. I just didn't feel like it. I just sort of sat and did nothing. All I did was take off my hunting hat and put it in my pocket. All of a sudden, this lady got on at Trenton and sat down next to me. Practically, the whole car was empty because it was pretty late and all, but she sat down next to me instead of an empty seat because she had this big bag with her and I was sitting in the front seat. She stuck the bag right in the middle of the aisle where the conductor and everybody could trip over it. She had these orchids on, like she'd just been to a big party or something. She was around 40 or 45, I guess, but she was very good looking. Women kill me. They really do. I don't mean I'm oversexed or anything like that, although I am quite sexy. I just like them. I mean, they're always leaving their goddamn bags in the middle of the aisle. Anyway, we were sitting there, and all of a sudden she said to me, Excuse me, but isn't that a Pensy Prep sticker? She was looking at my suitcases up on the rack. Uh, yes, it is, I said. She was right. I did have a goddamn Pensy sticker on one of my Gladstones. Very corny, I'll admit. Oh, do you go to Pensy? she said. She had a nice voice, a nice telephone voice, mostly. She should have carried a goddamn telephone around with her. Yes, I do, I said. Oh, how lovely. Perhaps you know my son, then. Ernest Murrow? He goes to Pensy. Uh, yes, I do. He's in my class. Her son was doubtless the biggest bastard that ever went to Pensy in that whole crummy history of the school. He was always going down to the corridor after he'd had a shower, snapping his saggy old wet towel at people's asses. That's exactly the kind of guy he was. Oh, how nice, the lady said, but not corny. She was just nice and all. I must tell Ernest we met, she said. May I ask your name, dear? Um, Rudolf Schmidt, I told her. I didn't feel like giving her my whole life history. Rudolf Schmidt was the name of the janitor of our dorm. Do you like Pensy? she asked me. Pensy? Um, it's not too bad. It's not paradise or anything, but it's as good as most schools. Some of the faculty are pretty conscientious. Ernest just adores it. I know he does, I said. Then I started shooting the old crap around a little bit. He adapts himself very well to things. He really does. I mean, he really knows how to adapt himself. Do you think so? She asked me. She sounded interested as hell. Ernest? Sure, I said. Then I watched her take off her gloves. Boy, she was lousy with rocks. I just broke a nail getting out of a cab, she said. She looked up at me and sort of smiled. She had a terrific nice smile. She really did. Most people have hardly any smile at all, or a lousy one. Ernest's father and I sometimes worry about him, she said. We sometimes feel he's not terribly good mixer. How do you mean? Well, he's a very sensitive boy. He's really never been a terribly good mixer with other boys. Perhaps he takes things a little more seriously than he should at his age. Sensitive. That killed me. That guy Morrow was about as sensitive as a goddamn toilet seat. I gave her a good look. She didn't look like any dope to me. She looked like she might have a pretty darn good idea what a bastard she was the mother of. But you can't always tell with somebody's mother, I mean. Mothers are slightly insane. The thing is, though, I liked old Morrow's mother. She was all right. Would you care for a cigarette, I asked her. She looked all around. I don't believe this is a smoker, Rudolph, she said. Rudolph, that killed me. That's all right. We can smoke till they start screaming at us, I said. She took a cigarette off me and I gave her a light. She looked nice, smoking. She inhaled and all, but she didn't woof the smoke down the way most women her age do. She had a lot of charm. She had quite a lot of sex appeal, too, if you really want to know. She was looking at me, sort of funny. I may be wrong, but I believe your nose is bleeding, dear, she said, all of a sudden. I nodded and took out my handkerchief. I got hit with a snowball, I said. One of those very icy ones. I probably would have told her what really happened, but it would have taken too long. I liked her, though. 
I was beginning to feel sort of sorry. I told her my name was Rudolf Schmidt. Old Ernie, I said, he's one of the most popular boys at Pensy. Did you know that? No, I didn't. I nodded. It really took everybody quite a long time to get to know him. He's a funny guy, a strange guy in lots of ways. Know what I mean? Like when I first met him, when I first met him, I thought he was kind of snobbish. That's what I thought, but he isn't. He's just got this very original personality that takes you a little while to get to know him. Old Mrs. Murrow didn't say anything, but boy, you should have seen her. I had her glued to her seat. You take somebody's mother, all they want to hear about is how hot shot their son is. Then I really start chucking the old crap around. Did he tell you about the elections, I asked her? The class elections? She shook her head. I had her in a trance, like I really did. Well, a bunch of us wanted old Ernie to be president of the class. I mean, he was the unanimous choice. I mean, he was the only boy that could really handle the job, I said. Boy, was I chucking it. But this other boy, Harry Fincer, was elected. And the reason he was elected was a simple and obvious reason was because Ernie wouldn't let us nominate him because he's so darn shy and modest and all. He refused. Boy, he's really shy. You ought to make him try to get over that. I looked at her. Didn't he tell you about it? No, he didn't. I nodded. That's Ernie. He wouldn't. That's the only one fault with him. He's too shy and modest. You really ought to get him to try to relax occasionally. Right that minute, the conductor came around for old Mrs. Murrow's ticket and gave me a chance to quit shooting it. I'm glad I shot it for a while, though. You take a guy like Morrow that's always snapping their towel at people's asses, really trying to hurt somebody with it, they don't just stay a rat while they're a kid. They stay a rat their whole life. But I bet after all that crap I shot Mrs. Murrow, kept thinking of him now as this very shy, modest guy that wouldn't let us nominate him for president. She might. You can't tell. Mothers aren't too sharp about that stuff. Would you care for a cocktail? I asked her. I was feeling in the mood for one myself. We can go in the club car, all right? Dear, you're, you are, are allowed to order drinks, she asked me. Not snotty, though. She was too charming and all to be snotty. Well, no, not exactly, but I can usually get them on account of my height, I said, and I have quite a bit of gray hair. I turned sideways and showed her my gray hair. It fascinated the hell out of her. Come on, join me, why don't you? I said. I'd have enjoyed having you. I really don't think I'd better. Thank you so much, though, dear, she said. Anyway, the club car's probably closed. It's quite late, you know. She was right. I'd forgotten all about what time it was. Then she looked at me and asked me what I was afraid of. She was going to ask me. Ernest wrote that he'd be home on Wednesday, that Christmas vacation would start on Wednesday, she said. I hope you weren't called home suddenly because of an illness in the family. She really looked worried about it. She wasn't just being nosy, you could tell. Uh, no, everybody's fine at home, I said. Uh, it's me. I have uh, this operation. Oh, I'm so sorry, she said. She really was, too. I was right away sorry I'd said it, but it was too late. It isn't very serious. I have this tiny little tumor in my brain. Oh, no, she put her hand up to her mouth and all. Oh, I'll bet I'll be all right and everything. It's right near the outside, and it's a very thin one. They can take it out in about two minutes. Then I started reading this timetable I had in my pocket, just to stop lying. Once I get started, I can go on for hours if I feel like it. No kidding, hours. We didn't talk too much after that. She started reading this vogue she had with her, and I looked out the window for a while. She got off at Newark. She wished me a lot of luck with the operation and all. She kept calling me Rudolph. Then she invited me to visit Ernie during the summer at Gloucester, Massachusetts. She said that her house was right on the beach and they had a tennis court and all, but I just thanked her and told her I was going to South America with my grandmother, which was really one because my grandmother hardly even goes out of the house, except maybe to go to a goddamn matinee or something. But I wouldn't visit that son of a bitch Moro for all the dough in the world, even if I was desperate.